All right, guys, it's time for the next level guy show. A men's interview, interest, and improvement focused podcast featuring interviews with the greats from all industries to help you better your life. Each week, a new episode features an interview with one of the greats covering all aspects of their story from life hacks to tips and protocols that have allowed them to live life on the next level. We then highlight concrete action steps that you can use to improve your life. And now, your host, Ian Dawson McKay. Today's guest is Dr. Mahmoud Ghanim. Born and raised in Lebanon, Dr. Mahmoud is director of the Centre for Medical Mycology at Case Western Reserve University. It's one of the top 25 medical research universities in the United States. He began his scientific journey in England where he studied Candida, a species of fungi that when allowed to grow uncontrolled can cause an infection that affects millions of people worldwide. This provoked his curiosity about the whole area of fungal microorganisms in the human body. Through the next four decades of research, he discovered that while there was a massive rise in studies of bacteria, fungus was largely ignored. One reason is that fungal organisms tend to be highly unstable, making them extremely difficult to study. For the longest time, Dr. Nanum's work was known only to a minority within the scientific community. While many have heard of Candida, few people have any idea of the critical role that fungus plays in human health. Through his research, Dr. Ghanoum established that fungal organisms constitute an essential part of the microbiome. In fact, in 2010, Dr. Ghanoum was the first scientist to identify over 100 native species of fungi in the oral cavity. Like with bacteria, there are good fungi as well as bad fungi. And just as it was startling to discover that we need positive bacteria in our guts, most people today are shocked to learn that their health depends on flourishing colonies of helpful fungi. And in this interview, we discuss his story, factors affecting our gut health, the key role of fungi, lifestyle hacks you can make, the connection between the gut and the brain, and so much more. And now, let's get to the interview. Thank you so much for doing this. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Love the book. But for people who maybe don't recognise your name, now you're a living legend in your field and um, scientific research. But for those who don't know the name, could you just give a quick introduction of who you are? And, um, you know, why gut health is important. So uh, my name is Mahmoud Ganou. I am originally from Lebanon, uh, Beirut, uh, the capital of Lebanon. And I am currently at Case Western Reserve University. I am tenured professor and I direct the uh, Center for Fung- uh, for Medical Mycology. In other words, the center that studies fungi or fungus, if you will, as well as the integrated microbiome core. Again, it looks at the microbiome in general. I also uh, really have an entrepreneurial nature. I love to use the research that we uh, do, try to translate it to help people. Now, my first question, strangely, is how did you get into this? It's not, it's not the usual thing that I hear people sort of want to go into. So was there a moment in your sort of youth um, and upbringing that made you think, yeah, I want to look at fungal? You know, what, was there a natural curiosity uh, to see why we were the way we were? Or, you know, how did this come about? Really, it started my journey with this in this field when I came to England, uh, as I mentioned the uh, before the call, I went to England to do my uh, Master of Science in Medicinal Chemistry, and then I stayed and did a, my doctorate, PhD, in microbial physiology. And you know how they do the education in uh, the UK, different from what you have it here in the US. My mentor or supervisor came, he said, Mahmoud, this is what you are working, uh, this is what you will be working on. And what it is, it was about a candida infection in a rabbit, which happened when they treated the rabbit with an antibiotic or even steroids, you know, these anti-inflammatory uh, compounds. And lo and behold, when you give this antibiotic and steroids to uh, these animals, even 
human have the same sort of issues, you will start to develop fungal, fungal infections or infection by the Candida, which is well-known yeast and fungal infection. So ever since, which is over 40 years, believe it or not, uh, I fell in love with Candida. Yeah. I, I want to give you a laugh. After I finished my PhD, I say, no, no, I had enough of candida. I'm not going to do any more research in it. <laughs> then, uh, you know, two years later, I said, what am I doing? I know this. Let me go back. And that's how I started. Well, you certainly don't look like you're old enough for that kind of you know, amazing career. I mean, you've been, is it something like over 25,000 references to your work you know you've written an amazing book um she just seemed you go from strength to strength and is you know how lately we've noticed a kind of rise in people paying attention to gut health yes. are you are you happy with the way that gut health is kind of promoted because a lot of people would assume gut health activity yogurt one a day that's me sorted What's your yes. opinion on this? Are you pleased to see the education is moving towards, you know, promotion of healthy guts, understanding of it? Or are you thinking now that maybe they've simplified it too much and people need a better understanding? I really think it's and we are we live in an exciting time as far as uh, the gut health is concerned. You know, for many years, all what we think about is we eat food just, you know, to stay alive or to enjoy the food we have, you know, the cuisines and this sort of thing. We never thought that what we eat could also affect our gut. And also, we never thought that we have germs in our body. Always we thought about germs that they are bad news. We have to kill them and use antibiotics. Now, the, with this new revolution in what you call next generation sequencing, we were able to see that in our gut, there is good bacteria, good fungus, as well as bad ones. And really what's fascinating about this field, we're starting to learn that by we are able to really improve our health by taking care of this community, which you call microbiome. It's, ba it's basically community of microbes, microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, viruses, archaea, and even parasites live there. So even though they live in our gut, some of them are our friends, but others are bad. So to me, I really believe, as I mentioned, this is exciting times because by this new understanding, we may be changing the way medicine is practiced over the time. If, if this area of research continues and discoveries keep coming. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating to sort of read it. And I mean, I, I've kind of got a quite good understanding through my job and through, you know, sort of previous education. But how would you describe the the GAT setup to somebody who's maybe completely new to this, you know, only eats food because they were hungry, didn't really understand, you know, why they were maybe getting digestive problems, constipation, those sort of things. Is there a way to understand what should be there and what shouldn't be there, you know? Yes, there are a couple of ways to know that. First of all, you if you there is there are tests like for example, I started a company after my work with Crohn's disease and showing that there is imbalance of these microbes. You are able to do gut test through the company called Biome and you will be able to see in your gut what sort of bugs or microbes are there. And as you alluded to, there are some good ones, beneficial microbes, but there are some harmful ones. So to me, what's fascinating is the knowledge that we really have it in our hand to try to balance our gut. Because if we balance these organisms, we are going to have good gut health as well as overall health. To me, I look at it, it's like a garden. You know, in Scotland, you have beautiful uh, roses, beautiful fields. I was watching the other day a film and I say, oh, from England uh, and, and Scotland, and they showed all these lovely gardens. So these lovely gardens, you can take care of them. 
and you fertilize them so that you'll have the lovely roses you have. Whereas if you don't do that, what's going to happen, you are going to have all these weeds and really you lose the charm of nice stroll in the spring. So it's the same about our gut. Our gut it has good bugs and bad ones. So to us, if we feed the good beneficial microbes, it will help us to keep the bad ones under control. And because of this, you will start to feel better in your gut health. And also what's so fascinating, if you have a good health because of the gut brain access, you will also have better overall mood and better really overall health. That's a very good way of putting it. I really like the kind of I, uh, sort of idea when I used to think of it as uh, like an ecosystem, like a pond, you know, prey and predators and things like that. And the way you've wrote it in the book makes a lot of sense, you know, because sometimes with scientific journals and other books, they kind of they're almost like trying to overcomplicate it by showing exactly everything they know. And you've wrote in your book, it's very like it's really and it's. How do I say this politely? It's it's easy to understand if you're layman or scientist, and I think that's what it's and it's welcoming. And you make it, you really teach the reader not only like what it is, it's also why you're doing this and how it's going to benefit you. And I think that's something that the market's really been missing because a lot of people don't really understand this. You know, we have to put rises in depression, ADH, all these kind of conditions. Um, but what? do you notice are like the key identif- out of, um, the, the key identification signs of somebody with poor or inadequate gut health? You know, how do we notice when it equals uh, di- is it dysbosis? When it thinks Dysbiosis. Yeah, Dysbiosis. sorry, I knew was going to murder that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's not easy. Uh, it's dysbiosis, it means imbalance. So basically, we know you wake up sometimes in the morning and you have a little bit, you ca- you know, constipation. You may have some bloating, some gas. All of these are indicator that there is some imbalance there. OK, of course, uh, you may have a little bit more severe stuff, but then we are talking about a disease. Let's say, you know, inflammatory symptoms in Crohn's disease or colitis. But Based on what you are asking me, it's really simple symptoms, GI symptoms, which could guide us to tell us, you know, there is something wrong. We really need to adjust our microbiome or bring it back from dysbiosis to become balanced. And we have what you call homeostasis, where everything is happy and living together. Well, in Total Gut Health, uh, sorry, Total Gut Balance, your amazing book, you have not only just the sort of science behind it, you really go into also the diet, you know, the changes, and also give us some amazing recipes. And I was kind of blown away because normally you see these things and it's cut out every single bad thing. You know, it's like you're eating lettuce and some tuna for like three (laughs) meals a day. And these were very (laughs) nutritional. They looked amazing. And I, I could even see myself, who I've been an avid red meat eater for years. Sure. You know, I've had terrible a terrible diet when I was younger. And I was looking going, oh, I'm trying yeah. that. I'm going to eat that. I'm going to eat that. But can you explain to us, like, why do we crave, typically, do we go for, like, processed foods, sugar? Is this a natural thing that we do? Or is there something... In like, you know, do our parents diet kind of pass on to us as children or is it the, you know, we've just grown up in a society where those foods are more readily available? You know, are are we born with a, you know, like a bacterium that will actually make us go for these kind of foods? Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is really very important question. And I think it's all of the above, like a lot of the time. Remember now it's so easy to go and buy fast food. It's so easy to, uh, you know, just get what you want. And a lot of sweets, uh, a a lot of things with salt, because remember, adding salt to something or adding sweet 
we are we all or let's let's say not all let's say a large number of us like sweet have sweet tooth okay so if you have a sweet tooth then once they give you you eat and now the more sweet you have the more you crave crave it why i give you an example the best example is candida candida which is the yeast we talked about at the beginning loves sugar so you give it more sugar the more sugar you give it the more it wants so so that's one thing the other thing you really bring up a very important point you need a diet that is sustainable so you can be flexible to me i look at it like i look at life it's all moderation okay i i was brought up as i mentioned in lebanon and i love lamb for example which i know in scotland you have you have a lot of lamb <laughs> and this <laughs> so i love it but i love at the same time fish you know being at the mediterranean we have lovely fish so what you need to do take a little bit it doesn't hurt the problem is if if we overindulge everything is super sized like <laughs> you go now to mcdonald and everything is super sized whereas if you take a little bit of here a little bit of there and then add some beneficial stuff with fibers and this sort of thing then you are going to be fine so to me also you need something you as you say you can sustain how long can you just eat i love tuna how many times can i eat tuna you know uh, so that's why it moderation is the way and you sometimes need to think about it a person need to think about it when you are eating you say okay i had enough now i had sweet it's lovely i enjoyed it i shouldn't have more because i already know the taste of sweet <laughs> so this is how i approach it now something i'm really interested in i've listened to a few viewers of um, interviews and something i was really interested in was uh, we imagine that when we're born uh, a child has just like a blank slate but there was a, a parts in other interviews where they talked about how we take you know bacteriums and microbes and things like that from our mother from the environment etc can you explain how from the very start like how would we develop our digestive systems you know how, where do we get the bacteriums the microbes are we born yes. with it and or do we take it from the environment or elsewhere I, I think what what happens when you are when even the, when a baby is still in their mother's womb, they get some microorganisms from their mom, and also the way when they are delivered, you have all these microbes in the uh, reproductive system or the vagina. Also, they get exposed in uh, in the baby. Of course, also the way your mom uh, feed you. You know, you have all this nice breast uh, milk with some organisms there, because as you know, there are some microbes in our skin as well. It's not just an only our gut. So we can get exposed, exposed to it. That's why a lot of it starts from there. But then with the diet that is introduced as we go to solid food and other other stuff, we start eating beyond milk. Then you also acquire some of these uh, organisms from the environment so it's from the environment around you that's why I tell people listen go for hikes go for walks because play sometimes with the dust because and the, and the soil because there are some good organisms there which will train our body to really fight infection as well so it's from your environment from your mom uh, from your diet all this start to build and your microbiome as a baby keep changing but then after some time it stabilizes and then you become your own uh, environment uh, in the gut with your own profile or own group of microbes because that that was the part that sort of blew me away was the how you sort of absorb it you know not just from the environment but also for, from what you eat but also from the way you were born from if you're bottle fed or breastfed you know it was like exactly. you could see how we how you any you know two twins could change their gut health just by the couple of choices they make at such an early age are we kind of linked to our parents in the sense that where we're born dictates what kind of foods we should be eating or what we sort of have a you know a natural kind of 
sort of acceptance of or is it what our parents have eaten their diets so for example i've born in the highlands of scotland so you know it's there's more meat and potatoes perhaps than you know like yourself who's maybe had the mediterranean diet while you were younger does our parents or our culture or you know like where you're brought up affect our gut health and the natural balance oh, no doubt about it no doubt about it and if you think about it when as you said from the highland in Scotland to the Mediterranean, we are both exposed to different food because of our environment. You know, like in in uh, in in Scotland, you have a lot of, uh, as as we mentioned, sheep. You have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, animals. You know, birds and whatever, where people, uh, you know, game game what you call uh, people uh, enjoy. In the Mediterranean, because of the weather, we have a lot of vegetables, a lot of, we are at the sea. So you get used to this environment. So a lot of the time, uh, it's amazing how we uh, really build our microbiome based on that. And in fact, there was a study, I can tell you, they, com- they compared kids from Guinea-Bissau in, in Africa with those from Italy. And when they looked at their microbiome, they found different profiles between the two. So why? Because a lot of the people in the African uh, 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 environment, they eat a lot of grains, they eat a lot of, you know, uh, vegetables, uh, a lot of stuff from their land, you know, whereas in Italy, you are, are going to eat a lot of pasta, a lot of, uh, you know, you know how uh, uh, the food uh, in Italy is. So, and that really affect what we eat. What's amazing is, I tell you, my son-in-law, uh, he is American, and he was brought up in a Western diet, okay? And I don't know what happened to him. I could not believe it. And I can tell you, <laughs> it is not my influence. He started to eat all these uh, uh, really what you call beneficial food, very uh, nice, uh, nutritionally balanced whole food and you don't believe it he really changed so much so again to go back how do we build it it's our family it's the, the ge- where geographically we live and also what we get used to but lo and behold as the example I gave you of my son-in-law he was able to shift and really he improved Basically, from what he tells me, he improved his sleep, he improved his gut health, and he lost some weight. So all that is could be explained by the changes of the microbiome and how it could help you have a better gut health. Because the Mediterranean diet looks amazing. You know, I, I, I've sampled it at times when I've, I'm going to make a change. You know, I'm going to change my habits and I'm going to get fit. And you. You know, you st- I've tried it and I've lasted maybe a couple of weeks and then I've gone back, had one bad thing and that's it. I seem to sort of crash and burn and then have to wait till I get my diet <laughs> sorted again. Yeah, um, yeah. But I was really impressed in your book when it mentioned that you can make the changes almost in automatic. But is this a sort of subtle change where some things improve? And there's like a longer term change by a change in the diet. So say if I switched from a meat based diet to a more sort of, you know, vegetables and fish and stuff like that. Can your gut health change rapidly or is it certain stages and certain parts of it would change? And then a sort of more prolonged change as your diet improved over the long term? Uh, definitely, this is very, very, very good question. I think some microbes can change very quickly. And in the book, we mentioned that especially fungi, fungus can change very fast. There was a study by uh, Dr. Hoffman where he looked at short term diet versus long term diet. And what he found that the short term diet, people were able to change the, the makeup of the Fung, fungi or the fungus in their gut, whereas to change the bacterial profile or what lives in our gut as far as bacteria is concerned, it took a little bit longer. So to me, what I always tell people, look, if you want to change, don't go, don't go extreme. Remember, we were talking about moderation. I will start slowly. It may take you some time, two to three weeks to start to 
uh, get used to the new food, you know. Now, what we did a study, uh, which I mentioned in the book, where we had people uh, eat what is in the total gut balance uh, diet, okay? And when we looked at their microbiome, and what we noticed that after two weeks, you'll start to see some changes in the makeup of microbes in your gut. But a lot of people did not see a change with respect to the symptoms, for example, constipation, cravings. However, by three and fourth week, by the third and fourth week, they started to see that really the symptoms, also the bad symptoms which they had went down. So to me, you just take your time, start slowly, you will start to change, but don't expect a miracle overnight, okay? I would say three to four weeks, you will start to see these changes because then you give enough time for the microbes in your gut, which are the beneficial one, to take hold and keep the other uh, bugs which are harmful down. Yeah, because it certainly makes sense of, like, you know, you all get that sort of, it's almost like a clean feeling when you've been eating a lot of sort of junk food and, you know, then you suddenly switch to vegetables and a lot of like citrus fruits and things like that. Um, I've certainly noticed, I mean, I used to suffer from a bit of depression when I was younger and I certainly noticed a connection between my mood and what I was eating coupled with the exercise and the amount of water I drunk. Um, but you, could you go into a little bit then about is the sort of the way that the gut is set up i mean does it prefer an alkaline versus an acidic kind of system how does the the microbiome work with the the mitobiome you know how how do we kind of understand what we're eating not so much of just what we're eating but what it's going to do to our system and understand you know like constipation diarrhea things like that is there a way we can sort of test ourselves what's causing or giving us the grief in our system yes uh, first of all as we mentioned before we need to have a balanced microbiome to have a balanced microbiome you'll start feeding the good microbes and what these do good microbes do for example i give you lactobacillus Lactobacillus and bifidobacterium are good microbes. Once they have enough of them in number, they are able to keep the bad ones down, as I mentioned. But also what they do, they can they can secrete or, yeah, like basically secrete small chemicals called metabolites. And these metabolites have benefit where like, for example, short chain fatty acids. It's fatty acids that have short chain or not long chain fatty acids, okay? These short chain fatty acids, they go into our blood and then they can help our immune system, for example. So what happens, this interplay between bacteria and fungi is very, very critical. If you have good bugs, they keep the one the bad one down however if we have more of the bad guys guess what they do they'll start working together and they form what we call digestive plaque or digestive biofilm it's like the plaque in our teeth every morning we brush our teeth to get rid of the plaque you know otherwise we'll start having uh, problems dental problems the caries periodontitis and this sort of thing so we'll try to get rid of this biofilm lo and behold our research showed that the same thing happened in the gut where we have biofilms of bad bacteria and bad fungus such as E. coli, Siracia marcescens, and Candida, they come and work together and they form a protected environment where good bugs cannot get them, okay? And once they form this protective environment, they start to affect our gut lining. They start to cause damage to the gut. And that's why you'll start to have leaky gut syndrome, for example, like uh, small molecules as well as cells which from the pathogenic organism 
or the bad ones start to go into our blood and cause uh, issues. So yes, there is, the, as I mentioned, it's like in the garden. If you don't keep the weeds down, they are going to take over. And guess what? Then it becomes a big issue. I've always been terrible at gardening. And it's like, um, <laughs> I mean, that that's the part that scared me in the book. Was I always assumed it was one of those you eat clean for a bit and it could clean out your system. You know, you, you could never like I know how your fat cells remain in the body. You can never sort of get truly rid of them. But I always thought like, you know, you can fix your diet by kind of eating a grown up sort of diet for for yourself. But when I read about the, the biofilm and how it created, you know, like a jelly substance that sort of stopped you know the the good stuff get into them that scared me i was kind of like oh right you know, yeah but it certainly made sense of why some people can change their diets and they never seem to get truly healthy or kind of like regenerate or get back to where they were is it a way of breaking this up or is it a way of identifying that a, bi- a biofilm has been created in you or is this the kind of thing you would need to test through fecal matter and that sort of thing I think you can do, uh, you can look at the biofilm, but the problem in the gut is like you need to take biopsy. It's not simple. So, uh, you know, to go in, uh, put a scope, take a piece of the uh, gu- uh, of the gut and then look and uh, look under it, you know, whether culture it or look under the uh, electron microscope to see the biofilms. So this is not tenable. What you can do, however, is if you can have a digestive uh, or what you call a gut test where you have fecal samples and we can look at the abundance or the level of different organisms in the gut. And if you see that there is an increase of the bad ones, then you know the likelihood that these are going to make a biofilm, you know. so that's that's the best way is to do gut test, see what what are the um, main organisms there, especially the pathogens as well as the good ones. Because if you do the test and you find you don't have good, a lot of lactobacillus or a lot of bifidobacterium or a lot of saccharomyces, for example, you know the yeast which we have, which we use to make beer, or you know. Uh, which is a good bag. So you need to start to help them by giving them the right food. And maybe sometimes in in certain cases, you need to take a probiotic that have these good organisms. So you give them a hand so that they are able to increase in number and keep the bad ones out. Now, your book is brilliant in the sense that it, it really kind of educates the the reader in terms of not so much just what's going on in yourself, but also how it's affected outside it and what can cause it. Now, we were in a society now where, you know, we've got all these hand gels, we're cleaning our, like, our surfaces far more. Um, we've got far, a lot more use of antibiotics than we really should be using. Okay. Prevalence of sugar in our diet, super bags everywhere. Can you go into a little bit about how you would advise people to set up their lives in terms of use of cleaning products, alcohol consumption? You know, do pets affect us? Do, do the how we keep our cars, our offices? You know, if you if you could sort of say to people a general kind of set of rules for them to kind of be a bit healthier in terms of what affects your guts by the environment they put themselves in? Yes, it's a bit of a difficult question, but... No, no, no no problem. Look, first of all, as we said, the first step is start thinking about how I can modify my diet to support these organisms, okay? Number two, can we eat certain types of food like garlic, for example, uh, or... Uh, fiber to support these 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 bugs. So that's from the food point of view. Also, go out in the environment, enjoy yourself, uh, because we need to get exposed to some germs. Unfortunately, now with the pandemic, we are overusing, as you say, all these disinfectants, and definitely we are killing all the 
possible bugs, at least on the on our skin. You know, the same the same time people, if they have a little bit of sniffle or a little bit they think they have the flu, guess what they do? They go and take antibiotics. Antibiotics don't kill the viruses, so don't take those. Uh, except if you need them and except if your primary physician or GP, as you say, recommend it. Otherwise, no need for all extreme measures to get rid of the uh, bugs because the best example I can give you, you know, we said there are good bugs and there is bad bugs in our body. We need to kill the bad one. So if you use a broad spectrum antibiotic, which means an antibiotic that can kill everything, you know, it's not a good idea because it not only kills kills the organism that is causing the infection, it will kill the beneficial one as well. So it's better to use a narrow spectrum uh, antibiotic, which only targets certain organisms that are causing the infection, you know. Also, with respect to the environment, as I mentioned before, we should go hiking. And you you guys in Scotland, you have beautiful, beautiful hills. And go out because it does not hurt if we get exposed to the microbes in nature. You know, sometimes I give you a laugh when I lived uh, Many years ago, I lived in Kuwait. I was professor at Kuwait University. And we had a neighbor where he had a kid. Uh, and all the time he used to put these white gloves in this little poor kid. And then when he plays in the uh, uh, you know, soil or the sand there, it becomes dirty. He says, you see, it's so bad. And the poor guy was always sick. <laughs> so no, let them enjoy themselves. And then when they come into the house, wash their hands and whatever. So expose the, exposing ourselves to that, some of these organisms is not bad at all. One thing you mentioned is about the dogs. Also, it, it does not hurt us at all to have a dog. It's good to get exposed to these some of these germs, you know. And these dogs, anyway, apart from anything, they love you so much. They add great pleasure <laughs> about, about apart from their germs. Because <laughs> that's the way we were we were brought up, you know. It was like you ate proper food. You you went out and played in the mud. You had you know friends that you jumped on and dived around with each other and. You know, you played football till you're covered in mud and you got soaked through. And, you you know, we were never had this kind of like my generation back in the 80s. We never kind of had the the, the range of diseases and things like that. You know, it's here. Is it that we're understanding things better now and we understand what these things were and we probably called them by something else or just accepted them? Or have you noticed like all these kind of um, fungal and microbes and that becoming stronger because of our use of things like, you know, these anti-disinfectants and back t- um, taking the tablets and that yeah. sort of thing. Have we become oh, too clean? Uh, to be honest with you, we are by by over overusing all these uh, products. We are also leading to the generation of resistant bugs. The bugs are very smart. You know, bacteria is very smart. And guess what? Once you expose all the time using an antibiotic, an antibiotic, guess what happened? It it changes its genes so that it becomes resistant to these uh, drugs or these antibiotics. So overuse of these uh, organisms, we are really helping to allow that the bacteria, as well as more recently, the fungus become resistant to the drugs in the market which are supposed to help us to kill these infections. So it's very important that we, that's why we ha- we say uh, uh, antibiotic stewardship. You have to have a stewardship. Use it only when you need it. Don't just like, like what we do these days. Everybody, you know, oh, I don't feel well, let me have an antibiotic. No, you don't need it. Maybe you have something else because there are many, many, uh, could be many other issues wrong and it is not fungus i can give you a laugh like a lot of the time uh, as a somebody who worked with fungus you people go to dermatologist they look at their nails and they see it it's uh, discolored and this sort of thing they say oh this is fungal infection like this is fungus e- eating your nail 
And then I try to educate the uh, dermatologist, listen, 50% of dystrophic nails or nails that look discolored, thick, and this sort of thing could be due to reasons other than fungus. So before you start taking the antifungal or the drug that will kill the fungus, make sure there is a fungus. It could be because of cancer. It could be because of other other diseases which nothing to do with the bug. And by using that antifungal, you are really, first of all, you are not going to cure nail. You are not going to have beautiful nails again to go to the beach, <laughs> number one. Number two, you, you really are trying to help the fungus to develop resistance. It's time for a quick break. There are millions of potential products to buy, so how do you know which ones are worth your hard-earned money? Simple. You go to nextlevelguy.com slash affiliates and explore those that will transform and improve your life. You'll find deals, listener exclusives, and special offers with some great companies. Recommendations are 100% honest and only on items Ian has tried or believes in. The companies showcased will make you a better man in all areas of your life. Simply go to nextlevelguy.com slash affiliates and level up. Because that was something I was I was going to ask was, you know, people assume that when they look at their nails, oh, that's a sign of this. Or when they look at their hair, maybe going flatter than normal, they go, oh, it must be a sign of my, my diet. And, yeah. I, you know, I was just going to say, was, is there things that can be confused as sort of gut health? And I, I really like the answer is it's, you know, by trying to get rid of the bad stuff, you can also destroy the good stuff. And yes. I think that's the thing. It's, it's the it's that sort of like let's annihilate everything let's destroy everything without really understanding and I, th- I think that's the beauty of your work it's you're letting people understand that it's not just bad things there there's also a lot of good things like you say you've got to sort of tend to the weeds and let the good plants well the good bags grow so can you go into a little bit about um like the food side of things now you've got some amazing recipes but i noticed a lot of people want to know things like should i get grass-fed beef or should i get this kind of beef or you know should i go organic you know they always want the secret sauce but is there kind of factors that we should look for the foods we're picking you know is it a case of this kind of meat or this kind of fish should, you know how do we pick the types of food the quality of the food probably a better way of putting it that we buy and then ingest yeah, I think, look, this is really a very complicated issue. Number one, mm-hmm. it's great to have organic uh, organic food, for example, or uh, uh, chicken that is no antibiotic uh, fed chicken, so that because they, you, you have some of the antibiotic comes. The problem with this is that this food is very, very expensive, and people mm-hmm. cannot really afford all these uh, organic type of food. To me, as long as you are eating a whole food based, you know, uh, you need to look at the food that have a lot of fiber and like resistant starch, you know, like oatmeal, bananas, you know, all of these stuff, uh, try to have berries. Like I will not hang myself. I really need to do Uh, to eat everything which is organic. Because sometimes, first of all, it's not available. Second, it's too expensive. I need to have good protein. Can I get it from plants? Can I get it from fish? You know, okay, I love meat like you. It does not hurt at all if you take some meat. As long as you don't overindulge. It's not like you go and like you say, you know, I'll give you an example. Now I, I go and see there is a, uh, hamburger like two pounders oh my god this is too much to eat you know after some time because i i'm eating less now i try to control what i eat i enjoy my food but i just make the portion less in europe it's fantastic i must say uh, the portions of, of uh, food is much smaller which is good Whereas in the U.S. here, we have such big portions. And sometimes, you know, the way we are brought up, like your mother tells you, eat eat all the food in your plate because, you know, people in Africa are dying or something like this, you know. So oh, yeah. you don't, 
you don't have to do that, you know, and, and now I don't eat everything. So you need to be, get really food that have low in sugar. You need fiber. You need, uh, like avoid saturated fat, take unsaturated, you know, or uh, polyunsaturated plant fat is better than the other. Because also there are studies which showed that if you take, for example, lean protein from plants, whereas you take proteins from meat, the microbiome is better off if you take the lean protein from uh, plant or fish, for example, compared if you take it from the others. But again, like you and I have been talking, we really need to have moderation. I, I love chocolate, for example, okay? But take a small piece, don't take <laughs> the whole, uh, the whole so, bar. The whole bar. Because <laughs> that's what I really liked uh, one another interview you did where you were talking about, you know, I like a glass of wine and you were saying, but I don't drink the bottle, I have a couple or... I, I like this. I like the um, oh, I can't remember which you were saying that it was about a sweet that you really liked and oh, you have yeah, it in honey. moderation. And, yes. you, and it was great to hear because that's the thing. And is everybody immediately goes, I need to clean my diet. Right. I'm not eating any sweets. So they actually take the bits that your body does need out. You know, yes. and I work with a lot of girls who who'll turn around and say right i'm following this diet i've read in a magazine and it'll be i don't know if you've heard of the 5-2 diet where there's a couple of days a week where you have only 200 calories for example wow. yeah you know or they'll have like the soup only diet and then they'll go home and sit down and watch tv all night eating crap or drinking you know and I, i'm thinking like you're saying just go home and eat whole, whole foods but if you say that to people they think you're crazy it's all these fad diets by these influencers. And I keep saying to people, you know, just eat in moderation. Just exactly. eat normal portions. But yes. it's like, it's too yeah. simple, isn't it? People want yeah, this. Uh, it really just annoys you as well. I mean, <laughs> one, one of the best things I got told years ago was when you go shopping was to pick like your vegetables, but try to get a variety of colour. Like the more yes. color you could get in, the better nutrients, the better. Is that true? It really is. It really is. And you know, now nowadays, like I, at lunchtime, I really eat uh, vegetables. Like I eat fruits and vegetables. I love tomatoes. Oh, my goodness. When I was a little boy, I wasn't well. And my granny, you know, my grandmother took care of me. And she used to give me, you know, uh, uh, tomatoes. And we call it like mountain tomatoes. It's like you have it from uh, elev- you know high elevation in uh, Lebanon. And I used to eat it because it's fruit after all. You know, I still love tomatoes now, so I bring it at lunchtime. <laughs> and you know, just and then in the evening when I go, I can I can have a, a piece of steak, but I'll have a small portion. You know, mm. uh, it's all to do uh, honestly, honestly with with moderation and also balance it don't eat one type of uh, food like if i tell you it's like what we mentioned before if you eat tuna tuna or salmon salmon oh, you get fed up you know uh, as you say we have a saying in uh, 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 in lebanon they say if you're every day honey 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 <laughs> that's it you are you are done with honey you don't want it anymore so Try to have variety, try to have, as you say, in color, like cucumber, lettuce, tomatoes, have some chicken, have some um, uh, fish, uh, or some, I love, by the way, grains, for example, I love also pistachio. So try to, instead of having your snack to be again sweet, try to have some other nuts, you know? So if you try to have variety, you, you are not gonna go, uh, uh, really astray at all. Oh, you're making me hungry now. I was just remembering <laughs> some of the recipes in the book. I was like, I'm going to eat that just now. Or now you've said it, I'm like, oh, I could go get a chicken and get some salad. And oh. and that's what I liked about the, the book was there's a variety there. You know, it's not just chicken and salad, tuna. You know, there's a lot of different kind of meals. But when you were making the book, did you work with like a chef in terms of the types of oils to use, the spices. 
is there things that you found along like garlic for example yes. is there good like herbs and spices that we should use a lot more is there things oh, that yes. you would like us all to have in our kitchens I really think in addition to garlic and and garlic I I love because I published papers on it uh, this friend of mine and then I'll tell you what what else uh, we should have he used to when I was in Kuwait every day he comes to me he said Mahmoud you have to study garlic garlic is good I say leave me alone I don't want to study <laughs> garlic <laughs> but you know he never gave up so I thought you know my only way to just let him leave me alone is I study garlic and I publish two papers. <laughs> so anyway, so garlic is at the top of the list. Ginger, for example, really, if you have one tea, uh, teaspoon is, is uh, fantastic. Also, uh, turmeric. Everybody talks about turmeric these days. I think it's really very nice as well. You know, uh, uh, apple cider vinegar is really good because it has been shown to break biofilms uh, as well, you know. All right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, these sort. Uh, if we can have also uh, some other stuff, berries. Berries are really, really uh, fantastic. You know, uh, strawberries, and uh, you know, it's it, it's very very helpful. Another group of food which we thought it's uh, very good to have the fermented food. You know the kombucha, the kimchi, the pickles. You know, I remember all my granny and mom in the summer, they come and do this huge, big glass container of cucumber pickles and olive. Olive is fantastic as well. So, uh, you know, uh, these are some of the stuff which I love. I love that, that like you understand where your food comes from you're very hands-on with your food you know and i come from um like i've got family who own sheep so we see lambs being born you know the the sheep sometimes go into the abattoir we understood you know people had chickens and hens and eggs and you know we understood where food came from and i think that's sometimes a problem is a lot of people don't so they just buy the processed food because it's it tastes all right and it's there but it's sometimes it's if by understanding food and where it comes from can also make your your diet a bit better and they understand you know what's the difference between it i suppose rather than just showing off because you bought all organic yes i really agree with you it's so funny you said like you and i is funny because you told me when in the 80s and now i'm remembering my mom all the time (laughs) because you know when i was little boy uh, she used to go in the morning uh, to uh, sort of the uh, local market. She go to the uh, uh, grocery guy. She goes to the butcher. She talks to uh, people who just came uh, fish and she buys stuff and then she goes and cook it. Unfortunately, now everybody are so busy and uh, uh, wives, uh, God bless them, they have a full-time job, they have to take care of their kids and this sort of thing, and then they don't have that luxury which uh, uh, used to be and I enjoyed when I, I was a little boy. So, But we need to, at the same tri- time, try to think how we can reintroduce some of it. I know it's easier to go and buy food quickly, but it will be nice to even maybe at the weekend take a chance to get your own food, try to cook and this sort of thing and uh, select good, uh, fresh vegetables, good uh, meat, good uh, fish, and then cook it because you will know all the ingredients. You know how much olive oil you put in it, which as you know, it's fantastic olive oil. You know how much salt you put on it because if you go and buy all these processed food ready, they increase these amounts because you know, they are very smart because it it makes you want to eat more, okay? But if you are cooking to yourself, you will be able to control how much salt I put in it, how much sugar, what sort of things I put in it. And that will be, it has two advantages. One, you are eating healthy. Number two, you and your kids and family also are helping each other and enjoying the weekend. Because that was something I've, I've definitely got more into cooking recently. Um, and when I found your book, I was like, right, I need to get my skills up. So I've interviewed a guy called Ben Ebrill, who's from Sorted Food. And the, I really like one of the services they do. It's um, you pay basically like I think it's five pounds 
and you know it's the cost of a coffee uh, like uh-huh. a week and what they do is they teach you how to cook they tell you what to buy and they also teach you like step by step and i think that's a really good way of it it gets people actually cooking and hands-on with food and you know i mean like i've made some disasters in the kitchen but it gives you that kind of interest to actually find out about your food and like you're saying it's to know what's in there and i think that's what i like about your book as well is it gets people involved with food and kind of understanding of what's there and why it's good to eat it but how does things like time affect it you know because we're all like different shifts and people are eating later and does time affect the food we eat does portion control you know um somebody i interviewed was a guy called stan efferding he said walking for 10 minutes after every meal helps the digestion best thing he's ever done do these things really affect your gut health or is it just they they improve what we've got at that level i really think in addition to diet because i i I, as uh, you see, we covered it very well. I think we should also look at certain lifestyles. Like, for example, mm. walking. I always say, look, it's great if you can do half an hour walking. Not necessarily a day, three times a week. I, I tell you, I wake up in the morning, every morning, and I bought this elliptical machine. I have it in my basement, and I do half an hour during the week. During the weekend, I just take my dog for walks. I go out, uh, you know, hiking. So it's really very important to have, in addition to controlling the food, to have a better health, you need to do a bit of exercise. And again, remember, moderation is the way. Some people start exercising and they want extreme sport. No, no, you don't need that. Because even a study, and in fact, it was done in Scotland, uh, they showed that, People with extreme sport, their microbiome is not as good as the normal people uh, who uh, uh, really practice sport in moderation, okay? So it's a good idea to have a walk like your friend said. I really like that. Uh, Also, it's good to try to take a break sometimes, you know, from all the phones we have, emails, and especially now with this pandemic, it's unbelievable. So what I do in the evening, I put my phone in my office away from me because if it's next to me, you know, it keep buzzing and then you have to answer it. And and so, yeah, get rid of, uh, get rid of that, uh, rid of that. Also, I really think it's important to try for us to reduce some stress, yeah especially these days, you know, with the, the pandemic. It's really very, very stressful time. And, sorry, in fact, I'm writing now an article about microbiome-driven approach to reduce stress, uh, stress and depression during COVID. Because, you know, we know if we have imbalance in the microbiome have been shown to be really to affect our gut brain access and depression and our mood so if we try to balance that hopefully we'll have less less uh, depression and less stress because that was the part i really liked and well, another part i really liked in the book was the the way you talked about like depression and but also like brain fog you know it's the, how the the gut links with the mind and how even though you might not have a mental health condition you may have an effect being caused by what you've eaten and i don't think a lot of people link the two together they always put it down to stress or the situation it's never your diet your lifestyle could you just explain how the sort of brain and the gut are linked and how they work together you know what affects that kind of connection yes certainly like what happens uh we used to think that our brain tell us everything what to do and now with this research, we are seeing that there is bidirectional communication. In other words, the gut talks to the brain and the brain talks to the gut. So how is this? The gut, we have all these microbes that can produce. Remember, we said they produce these small molecules, metabolites, such as I gave you an example, short chain fatty acid, but also cortisol, which also affect our mood okay now at the same time if you have you know uh, imbalance 
in the neurotransmitters, you know, you will have effect in your gut. So we have, we communicate, we send these small compounds, small molecules where they really can guide how our gut uh, respond with respect to dysbiosis or imbalance and how our mood respond, okay? Uh, so in this regard, I just completed a study where we're looking at the autistic kids and we found that pe people, uh, kids with autism, you know, uh, and we found that there is imbalance in their gut and these organisms, they secrete some molecules which affects our neurodegenerative disease sort of, okay, like Alzheimer and autism. So it's these chemicals go back and forth and neurotransmitters which allow the, allow the gut to talk to the brain and the brain talk to the gut. I mean, that's really into. I really would like to read that because there is a lot of times I see people, you know, they immediately go, oh, get them antidepressants or give them like, you know, it's just the way the kid is, where a lot of times you think maybe if they improved the diet, maybe if they got their education a bit better, Yes. Or their exercise, you know, maybe they would help the child. And I think that's something we really should be, like, I'd, I'd be happy to promote it, um, if you can send me the link when it's ready. Yes. How do you think this is going to change now? You know, I mean, what is, what's your hope for the book? What's your hope for gut health education and research the way it's going? You know, I'm really hoping, first of all, for the book that if, to people, if, uh, if people follow the diets, try to rebalance their gut uh, uh, by eating the appropriate food, that this is going to help them eliminate some of the digestive symptoms like constipation, bloating, uh, uh, and other other symptoms we talked about. You know, uh, this is really will make me very very happy. And also, again, I like people to, if you want to follow the book. Just take your time. It's flexible. You can customize it to you. And start slowly. Like in the book, for example, we give one week for people to get used to the new type of eating. Because sometimes to go from something you eat every day, meat, 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 to no meat at all, that does, is not healthy. Just do a little bit of transition, you know. And once your body gets used to it, and once you change your microbiome, you are going to start to feel uh, better. So that's one thing I am very, very excited about. The other thing I am excited about, because the company which I uh, I co-founded co -founded with my son, Afif, uh, we are doing gut tests, okay? And this gut test, we are collecting data about people microbiome, their lifestyle, and also what type of, if they have any health issues, diseases, diabetes, uh, if they have obese or something. Now we are starting to see, can this data help us to come out with solutions to help these people with different uh, issues, digestive issues, for example. You know, this will be very exciting because what's nice about it, we have such a large sample, thousands of people, and now we got this new person who is bioinformatician because, you know, when you have so much data, you need somebody who really can deal with this data. Uh -huh. It's not easy job. So having this guy, now we tell him, okay, can you look at people with the simplest thing who are overweight? How, what is their microbiome? What is missing? What do we need to do? So this data, hopefully, my hope is going to allow us to discover new ways, again, to help people improve their gut health and overall wellness. I love that, because that was actually going to be a question I had was, when you take like the you know the tests, could you explain like if somebody wanted to get this um, through your company biome, how would they go about doing that and how does it work you know but also what does the information pr provide to you and to the person but i mean you've kind of answered that in terms of what you can do with it and how you can then help create solutions but what what does somebody who uses one of these tests get from it 
yeah, this is very, very important question. Basically, once you do the test, you send your fecal sample or stool sample, we analyze it, we look at what is the balance or the level, the level of uh, or abundance of organisms in your gut, the good ones, the bad ones. And then once we know this, we also, we take it into consideration. Then we also look at your lifestyle. Do you exercise? Are you stressed out? You know, do you sleep well? So we put all this together, and then based on this, we come out with the recommendations to the uh, uh, person who took the test, where we give them dietary diet approach. This is this diet is going to help to encourage the growth of the beneficial organism. We also give you. Uh, if, if there is a need for a vitamin, for example, like sometimes if people have uh, an imbalance and we have a lot of this uh, uh, group of organisms called protobacteria, having vitamin D3 will help you as well as fiber. So we'll try to guide you on, on this. Take this type of vitamin. While, while if you have uh, issues with candida, then you should have vitamin A, B, and C. So we give you information about that. Finally, we also give you lifestyle uh, uh, guidance or recommendations because a lot of the time we found that this lady put uh, uh, sent a test. We looked at her microbiome. It was out of balance. But when we looked at what she is eating, she really eating fantastic food. Then we looked at her questionnaire with respect to other lifestyle, and guess what? She was extremely stressed out. So I start to advise her and our nutritionist, we have a nutritionist uh, uh, team, they start to advise her to try to do some meditation, do some yoga, you know, because this will reduce the stress. Try to talk to people. You're, you know, as you say uh, in English, a problem shared, a problem halved, you know? Mm -hmm. Try to reduce the stress, and if you can, this is going to help you a lot. I mean, the thing is, like, I've literally still got pages and pages of questions. I knew we'd already have a round two, but some I was very interested in maybe doing, like, doing a test, and then we could, you know, go through what it showed and, like, you know, use me as a sort of guinea pig to kind of explain what each thing meant and how we could then change it. But... Something that just popped into my head just now is, is the data you're collecting, does that show a need to change things as you age or is it just more suited to the individual person? You know, does your requirements evolve or need amendment as you get older? And Sure, sure. This is very, first of all, if you take the test, we are giving you a picture, you know, snapshot of your gut. But then, because we have this big data, we are looking at people who are, let's say, 50 years and older or 60 and older. And then you'll try to look at that to say, how is their gut balance? And then if you can see, you compare these, uh, this group of people with those who are young and healthy, then you will know where is the dysbiosis or where is the imbalance and then you try to guide them what you need to do to bring it back that's why the benefit of the big data it's not only one person the one person will benefit when they do the test for themselves we are hoping and we have shown that this is the case but also we are all able to help others through having this large data i love that something that we get rid of you know like fecal matter it's something that can tell us not just about ourselves, but can can create something like that that can help save so many people and make people's lives better. And it's amazing that you can do that. You should be just, like amazingly proud of yourself for what you're doing Thank on a day to day you. basis. I mean, I know we're way over the time and like I've still got pages, so I would love to have you on again. But sure. What would you want to say to people listening? You know, is there a sort of a, a message that you would like them to remember before round two? Yeah, first of all, because we are in uh, in COVID era, I really want to tell you, I am an optimistic person. I think we are going to be fine and we are going to move forward and be uh, back to normal 
we just need to keep going. So I don't want anybody to lose hope because as my mom used to tell me, without hope, you don't go into heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and I want you all to be happy. So that's one message. The other message, I I really hope uh, that uh, this uh, book, uh, as well as the company Biome Health, uh, can help you adjust your gut and feel better uh, and very well. So for people who want to, you know, sort of get in touch, um, get a test, that sort of thing, could you explain how, um, you know, maybe do a quick sort of like uh, mention through your sort of social media, your website, if somebody wanted to go and get a test done now, how would they go about that? They can go to the website biomehealth.com uh, uh, and then you can, it's all uh, uh, digital electronically, you can uh, uh, request your test, you can fill the questionnaire, you can even follow up where once you send your sample, where is it in the uh, analysis, and then at the end you can get the report, but also it will help you if you would like to talk to our nutritionist also that happens. So it's all, you can get it on the site biomehealth.com. Also, it would be great if you want to learn more about gut health. We have a microbiome report uh, podcast where uh, uh, we talk a lot about different uh, uh, gut issues and other issues related to the microbiome. Well, that's it for another week. And thank you for listening. It's now time to take what you've learned and use it to develop and enhance your life with the key points mentioned. Listen, try it, embrace it, use it, and crush it. Now's your time to hit that next level in your life. If you liked this episode, then please leave a comment on the show notes or a review of the show on your podcast platform. Everything helps evolve the show. Until next week, keep seeking the next level in your life.